Hi, I'm Rudyard Griffiths, the host and moderator of the Monk Dialogues. Thank you for joining us for yet another dialogue on the big issues and ideas of our day. For the last number of weeks, post the US election, we've been focusing on some broader themes around this extraordinary moment we find ourselves in. We've been looking at the political and economic effects of this pandemic, uh, the changes that it's bringing to our lives, to the world. Today we're gonna to step back a bit. We're gonna take a longer view. We're gonna kind of look at what human history has to say about where we're at now, the effects of this uh, pandemic in the months and years to come, but also how can history help us look forward, potentially decades to understand the effects of this moment and the other big trends that could come uh, in the decades to come that will change our way of life fundamentally. To do this, we are exceedingly fortunate to have what I consider one of the world's uh, biggest minds and sharpest thinkers in Stanford historian uh, Ian Morris. He's an archeologist, uh, he's a historian, and he's the Willard Professor of Classics at Stanford University. He's the founder of Stanford's Archeology span Center where he served as its director, and he's the author of a series of internationally best-selling books. They're all on my bookshelf, and I expect on many of yours too. Why the West Rules for Now, uh, a classic for anyone who wants to understand the future and history of the global balance of power between East and West. The Measure of Civilization, a really interesting scientific look at social development and how social development over time can help us think about how our history has unfolded, but more importantly, where our future could be headed. And a book that really got me thinking about a whole bunch of issues, War, What Is It Good For? Ian Morris, thank you for joining us on the Monk Dialogues. Well, thanks very much for having me here. Well, here's what I wanna do, Ian. Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing for you know, somebody like me to make big prognostications uh, about the future. Uh, frankly, what do I know? But for someone uh, such as yourself who's spent an incredible amount of time thinking deeply about the past, about uh, the last 15,000 years of human history, both as a historian, as a classicist, but also as an archeologist, going to those cultures, to those places to kind of literally unearth human history. I want to start with a, a quote that's been featured in two of your recent books that we use to actually advertise your appearance on uh, the Monk Dialogues today. And it's a simple one, but I think an important one coming from someone like you. The next 40 years will be the most important in history. Ian, why? I, I want to know. It's the big W. Why are the next 40 years, despite the 15,000 that have gone before, why are they likely to be the most important in the human experience? Yeah, well, I, I, I got interested in, in sort of thinking about what history might be able to tell us about the future. Uh, about 15 years ago, um, the big debates were going on among historians about why it was that you know, um, the western part of the world, the countries around the shores of the North Atlantic, had come to dominate the planet in the 20th, 19th and 20th centuries in a way that no one had ever really done before. There were all these arguments going on. And um, I, just, I suspected that if you could see the kind of long-term shape of history, um, you would be able to get a much better understanding of you know, what had already happened and maybe also even project things forward and think about what was likely to come next. So, so I, I came up with this thing you mentioned, the Social Development Index, which was an attempt to measure how Eastern and Western societies had um, fared at mastering their environments and sort of getting what they wanted from the world, going all the way back to the, the last ice age, to about 14,000 BC. Um, so I, I did this because um, uh, I, I wanted to understand um, you know, what, at what point did the West really pull ahead of the East? Is this a recent development or a deep-seated one going far back into the past? Is it likely to persist for centuries to come or is it likely to go away? So I drew this graph. And I uh, wrote this whole book, Why the West Rules, about it uh, and what it told us about previous history. But then at the end of the book, I asked myself, well, so what will it look like if we project the trend lines on this graph of Eastern and Western social development, just projecting forward um, across the next century or so? 
And um, you know, as I'm sure everybody understands, you know, any any projection you make like this is only as good as the assumptions that um, lie behind it. So the assumptions that sort of lay behind my graph um, were not very sophisticated ones. I said, let's just make linear projections forward for another hundred years, see what happens to Eastern and Western development, and then we can start asking, you know, are, are these assumptions valid ones? What might happen to derail these trends? So anyway, that's what I did. And at the moment, um, by the way, I calculated things. Western development is way ahead of Eastern. Um, but Eastern development has been rising faster in the last 50 or 60 years than Western. This is sort of beginning to converge. And so if we make this linear projection, just push the lines forward, I was able to come up with a number for the exact year when the lines will cross, which is the year 2103. That is when the East catches up with the West. And um, that, uh, in some ways, this is a fantastically good prediction, though I say it myself. It's got all <laughs> the things a good prediction should have. So like it's precise. So if we get to 2104 and it hasn't happened, then you'll know I was wrong. It's also a long way in the future. So by the time we get to 2104 right. and discover that I was wrong, as <laughs> I definitely am, um, you, I, I won't have to worry about it anymore. I won't be here anymore. So um, great projection in some ways. In other ways, though, it's kind of a foolish projection because there's really been almost no period in the past when Eastern and Western development have carried on rising year on year at the same rate as they have done in previous centuries. So almost certainly something is going to happen so that this uh, outcome doesn't actually um, match up with reality. But I think that the, what it does do, the good thing about the prediction, is it kind of sets the bar and it gives you um, this sense of other things being equal. This is what is likely to happen. Um, the the, the, the uh, trends are going to converge. East is going to catch up with the West about 80 years or so from now. And then you can start asking, well, what might happen to speed that up, slow that down, bend the lines in different directions so it doesn't happen before. But it does, I think, it does set this, um, this sort of goalpost that we need to try to explain. And so if something like this is what happens with development, I think two big, to, to me, two big conclusions seem to jump out of it. And one was um, that uh, if the trends increase as rapidly as they have been doing across the 20th century, then the 21st century, we're likely to see more change in the coming 100 years, more change in the human condition in the coming 100 years than we've seen in the previous 100,000 years. We're looking mm -hmm. at a transformation of almost everything about what it is to be a human being. And so in my books, I've just speculated a little bit about the kinds of things that might be involved in this. But uh, again, you know, other things being equal, we're looking at the greatest transformation of the human race that there's ever been. And you know, 100 years from now, the human experience will feel as alien to us today as mm -hmm. our own experience would have felt to the Neanderthals. I mean, so this is absolutely mind-boggling kind of transformation we're looking at. One reason why I say the next 40 years, the point at which the, the curves really mm -hmm. get to inflect upwards, you see the knee of the curve, um, next 40 years are likely to be the most important in history. However, there's, there's always a but. Yeah. And in this case, um, this, the but is that when you look back at previous episodes in history where there's been previous uh, similar sort of accelerations in in the rate of change of development, and also convergence between different regions. A new region starts to pull ahead and assert itself on the stage. Every single time that there's been a major change like that, it's been accompanied by enormous amounts of violence. You know, this is one of the ways people have evolved to be able to deal with new and challenging things. We use force against each other. If we use force against each other in the 21st century, on the sort of scale we've seen in previous centuries, we're probably looking at a thermonuclear war. Uh, and a thermonuclear war is you know, very obviously one of the things that might change the shape of these curves. And lead us you know, not racing up to this um, technological transformation of what it means to be a human, but instead crashing back down. You know, Albert Einstein famously said, somebody asked him, yeah, what, how will they fight World War III? And he said, I have no idea how the Third World War fought, but I can tell you how they'll fight the Fourth with rocks. Mm. Um, if we have this sort of outcome of the trend lines, then we can expect um, you know, either the annihilation of humanity altogether or a complete collapse of civilization. So let's, un I, I, let's I, I, unpack some of this, uh, Ian, because this is fascinating stuff. And it's interesting to us to have this conversation in the middle of a pandemic, which has, for all of us in our yeah. lifetimes, has been, I think, one of the most 
globally shared and significant events in terms of its, its disruptions across the world. In, in your kind of score, your social development score, you assign 900 points of social development from the ice age, the end of the last ice age, 15,000 years ago, through to the start of, uh, of this century, the 21st century. If you predict based on the acceleration of social development over the last number of centuries into the coming hundred years, according to that graph and how it steepens upwards, we're gonna add another 5,000 points of social development in a hundred years, or five times what we did in the last 15,000. I mean, that, that would, as you say, suggest Something is coming, something that we can't understand now, which would be just an, an immense, earth-shattering transformation of the human experience. What, what do you think that something is? Yeah, well, I think um, we can get, a, you know, we can at least make some informed guesses about what might be happening next. Although one of the things I got interested in doing this work was like the, the history of science fiction writing. I mean, you know, people making projections about the future. And then you know, we can now go back to guys like H.G. Wells and Jules Verne and look at what bits of their projections are silly and what bits are absolutely ridiculous. Uh, so what bits make any sense. Um, and uh, there's a lot of silliness always. People get very badly wrong about a lot of things. But if you read the science fiction from 100 years ago, some of the basic things they could see reasonably clearly that there would be travel beyond this planet, um, new means of communication, they would like to talk to people on the other side of the world, or a lot of stuff that they did sort of um, foresee. And I think we may be in a similar kind of position. And so, one of the things that people are particularly focused on, the, the, the futurists, and you know, I work in, down in Silicon Valley at Stanford University, so I'm surrounded by these rather strange uh, techno-futurist people all the time. One of the things they talk about particularly is the potential of the transformation of the human brain. And of course, the, um, the human brain is the big part of our biological evolution that has made us unlike all the other animals. Um, and so what some of the techno guys are thinking about now is the ways in which we've already begun to augment the power of the brain with communication technology, and particularly the, the digitization of thought. I mean, there are already experiments have been done at a sort of very basic kind of telepathy by sending, you know, of course, brain waves or electrical signals flashing mm. between the neurons in your brain, detecting these, sending them over the internet. There was a, a great one a few years ago where a rat in North Carolina was made to move the feet on a rat in Brazil. Yeah. And um, a very simple experiment, an experiment at mapping human brains and uh, producing digital versions of them. And we're in the very early stages um, so far. And the arguments among the people doing this kind of work are just as fierce as the arguments you get among the historians or um, the political pundits. But uh, there's a sort of baseline of agreement that however it turns out, we are on the verge of a transformation of the human mind. And uh, we've just got this huge new institute here at Stanford, the human and artificial, human centered artificial intelligence, looking very largely at this sort of question. And again, nobody knows quite how this is going to go, but it promises to transform what it is to be a human being. At, le at least in certain ways. I mean, you <clears throat> talk about the pandemic as well. We will we will still have bodies. We will still be vulnerable to the sorts of things we have been vulnerable to um, ever since we evolved. And uh, one of the things where I feel um, I did get a prediction right in my book was to say there is going to be a pandemic. Yes, you wrote um, that. I, yeah, I say that you're not because I'm such a brilliant forecaster, but because anybody who is qualified, whose work you were looking at 10, 15 years ago, was saying exactly the same thing. Right? The World Health Organization's website, uh, when I was writing Why the West Rules in the late 2000s, the, the WHO website begins on the front page, it says, there will be a pandemic. There's no ifs or buts, there will be. And um, that's because these huge scale diseases, they are a side product of globalization. Like the, the Black Death, um, yeah, the Black Death famously was trying 
transmitted by fleas carried by rats and the fleas jump off and bite the people and so on and start the black death spreading um fleas carried by rats can only expand their geographical range by a tiny amount each year because you're reliant on the rats to move around and rats yeah they don't move around all that much mm-hmm. um the black death spreads across the old world from china to europe because people put the well they don't deliberately put the rats on boats but they have right. boats with food in them the rats get in and the people move the rats around and this has always been the way uh, the, the more people move around and interact, um, the faster these diseases spread. So now you can jump on a plane in Wuhan and fly to San Francisco and infect everybody in Santa Clara County in the space of a few hours. Uh, the potential for pandemics is enormous. So Ian, um, this is a, a good segue to, to talk about, in a sense, the, the other side of the coin. So you've painted a picture for us of the potential here for an explosion in social development, a kind of revolution in the human brain, uh, a somewhat utopian view of the world, because surely a lot of good things would come from, uh, you know, a 5x increase in your social development score, but at the start of the 20th century versus the end of the 20th century, when, according to your prediction, East and West could, could line up in terms of an equal level of, uh, of social development between the two sides. But here's a, another quote from your recent book, War, um, which talks about the other side of the coin. You write, when the Roman and Song dynasties failed to find solutions, they had the relative luxury of several centuries of slow decline. But we will not be so lucky. There are many possible paths that our future might follow but however much they wind around, most seem to lead ultimately to the same place, nightfall. What is nightfall, Ian? Uh, night, nightfall is a term I borrowed from Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer I mentioned a moment ago. That I went through a slightly obsessive phase of science fiction reading. And um, he had this great story. I think it was uh, like 1943 or so, somewhere around there that he wrote this. This great story about uh, a planet that orbits around multiple suns so that it's almost always light everywhere on the planet. But once every 10,000 years, they get to this little spot where their the, the sun their stars are all lined up and it actually goes dark um, on one side of the planet and when it goes dark no one's ever seen this before of course they all go nuts and they burn everything down civilization crashes completely and starts again from the ground level up and so i I just thought this is a great image um but when you look back across history you see that the, the things like nightfall don't actually happen. I mean, when you get the collapse of the Roman Empire or any kind of other great setbacks um, uh, we've seen in the past, things the clock never resets to zero. Um, You always lose all kinds of advanced skills, population crashes, people's lives are shorter and poorer, um, all kinds of terrible things. But you don't go all the way back to zero. You don't start again as Stone Age hunter-gatherers. What's different now, though, I think, from any previous time. Well, actually, two two big things are different. One is that in the past, um, there's been, globalization has always been very partial up till now. And the different parts of the world are disconnected from each other. So you can have a great collapse in one place, but another place not all that far away might be relatively unaffected by this. And so you've got all these regions sort of in interaction, but not completely linked together. You can have partial nightfalls. And of course, now we are moving into a world where everything is linked together. And the kind of threats that we've created for ourselves by this, like, say, you know, climate change, pandemics, and these are obvious ones. Um, The entire planet is linked together. I mean, no part of the planet pretty much has escaped COVID-19. If uh, climate change goes as badly as some of the predictions, as most of the predictions, every part of the planet is going to be affected, even if some more than others. Uh, But the one big thing, I think, that sort of moves us beyond even that level of scariness, is that if the record of the past, that these great transformations are always accompanied by mass violence, if that continues to dominate the future, well, we now live in a world with nuclear weapons. And that, I think that absolutely changes everything. And the the good news is that for every... um, uh, God, what was it? There were like 70 some thousand nuclear warheads in the world in the 1980s. And now, uh, well, depending on how you count, there's many ways to count, but there's considerably less than 10,000 knocking around now. 
So um, you know, pretty much for every 10 nuclear warheads in the world in the 1980s, we've now got, say, one available. We, we probably cannot kill everybody in the world in one day, the way we could have done around 1986, the peak of the arsenals. But we probably can kill as many people in one day as we killed in the whole of World War II. And nobody knows what the consequences are going to be of that sort of catastrophe. And of course, we're perfectly capable of building more nuclear weapons as well. So that, I would say, that is the big game changer. If we go down the path of all out violence, then we still have the potential there to destroy humanity altogether. Well, let's talk, Ian, about the, the big potential risk of where that violence could spring from, because it's a, a big part of, of your writing and research, these, these kind of clashes of empires, these ebbs and flows of geopolitical power from one region to another. Uh, so here we have a situation of, uh, you know, an America that kind of bestrode the world as a colossus after World War II, you could even say before World War II, now being challenged uh, economically first, but also increasingly technologically, and one has to wonder militarily in the future, by a rising China. As you've written and others have talked about, these are precarious situations when that large, comfortable power who's used to being in power finds itself challenged by a rival, a real rival. Um, tell us a little bit about why you think there are some analogies to the period prior to the First World War. You may want to go back to Thucydides and the, the contest between Athens and Sparta, but give us a sense of what you see as a, an important historical dynamic that has played out at various times in human history with profound effects. Yeah, yeah, I think this is something that uh, the, the kind of international tensions we see now are something that in, in different forms have played out over and over again in the past. And, and well, you, you mentioned Thucydides. He has this famous line about the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta. It starts in 431 BC. And um, it got recycled recently by the political scientist Graham Allison to talk about Sino-American relations. And Thucydides says, well, what made war inevitable? in 431 BC was the growth of Athenian power and Spartan fear of that growth. So the Spartans felt trapped that they had to do something to stop the Athenians getting more and more powerful and that a kind of preemptive declaration of war, it seems to, enough of them, it seemed like a preemptive declaration of war was the way to do that and head off um, Athenian growth, which led, of course, to this disastrous war that Sparta ultimately wins, but um, it, it kind of breaks Sparta at the same time. And so Alison uh, makes these rather gloomy predictions. He called this book what's like... Um, uh, the um, Thucydides yeah, trap. Yeah, destined for war. Or something mm -hmm. like this well. Gloomy prediction. Um, now, I'm, I guess I'm a bit less gloomy than that. I mean, I think that you know, nuclear weapons have completely changed the way great power relations um, play out in the world. But they're not the only thing that's changed um, in the late 20th century. And I think we've gotten a lot better now at mediating conflict. Uh, and I say, you, you look back even as far as the 18th or 19th, or even the early 20th century, using force often seemed to be one of the first options statesmen considered. Now, um, it's, I mean, there's a lot of potentially very tense places around the world where it is actually a little bit difficult to imagine anybody being so reckless as to think that um, a quick recourse to violence is going to be the solution to their problem. So they say something, you know, something like Taiwan is one of the places, of course, people look at all the time. Um, the, the People's Republic of China has always considered Taiwan just a breakaway province. There's always been talk of military solutions to the problem, just invade Taiwan, get it over with. Um, they've never done anything like that. And frankly, it never seems super likely to be about to do anything. And um, I one time uh, watched a video of this great speech that Bob Gates had given when he was Secretary of Defense um, here in the U.S. And somebody had asked, I think it was at West Point, and somebody had asked him, uh, you know, why does the U.S. have this terrible record at predicting where the next conflict is going to be? He says, oh, no, no, we don't have a terrible record. We have a perfect record. We have a 100% record. We have been wrong 100% of the time. <laughs> and then he goes on to explain that, and that he says, yeah, that's actually sort of inevitable. Because if you see a place like Taiwan, 
where there seems to be so much potential for conflict, well, you do something about it. Right. Uh, you put things in place to deter other people, make conflict less likely. And so you know, the more likely a place looks to become the center of the conflict, mm. In fact, maybe the less likely it actually is. It's the places you're not looking that always right. get you. So yeah, World War I doesn't break out over some colonial spat in North Africa, the way all of the, the clever academics were saying in sort of the early 1910s. breaks out in the Balkans. And these are the things that take us by surprise. And that's what I think um, we have to plan for, is the things that we kind of can't plan for. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. not a very optimistic conclusion to reach. Okay, Ian, we've got a, a ton of uh, questions for you, and I just want to remind our viewers that they can send questions in to dialogues at monkdebates.com. Uh, we're going to spend the balance of our time with Ian up to the top of the hour focused on answering your questions. That's what these monk dialogues are all about. I'm going to go first to a question, Ian, that was emailed in uh, previously to you. It's from Robert Kaufman. Uh, Robert's asking, Two value systems seem to be competing for primacy today, communal goals versus personal interests and freedom. In your opinion, which value system is most likely to allow humanity to thrive without exposing itself to existential risk? Great question, Robert. What's your thought, Ian? Yeah, yeah, that is a good question. Uh, th- this is one um, that I've been very interested in because, of course, a lot of people uh, who try to use history to think about what might come will tend to focus on these value systems. Uh, they clearly they play a big part I- in the story. And um, the, the most recent book that I wrote that came out in 2015 was called Foragers, Farmers and Fossil Fuels, How Human Values Evolve. And I try to do the same sort of thing of looking at long-term history to understand understand why uh, you say particularly th- values about equality um like why is it that through most of human history in the hunter-gatherer societies the value of equality was the one of the most highly prized values out there and if you're selfish in hunter-gatherer groups on the whole you're not going to do very well at all people will gang up to drag you down and yet then through most of uh, kind of the recorded part of history, when societies were based on agriculture, hierarchy came to be respected as an absolutely core value. It's like you go from a sense that people are all the same and no one should be better than any, uh, anyone else to a sense that nobody is the same. Everybody is different. And we should recognize these differences so that in a place like ancient Egypt, um, it seems perfectly legitimate to a lot of people to say, our kings are so much better than the rest of us that they can't be human at all. They must actually be gods. And then since the Industrial Revolution, we've swung back, not all the way to kind of hunter-gatherer ideas of egalitarianism and fairness, but a considerable Mm. distance in that way, uh, in that direction. And so I got very interested in, well, what's likely to happen in the 21st century is everything else changes so rapidly. Can we assume that... um, values and the the value that we put on different kinds of behavior is likely to remain the same and a lot of people in the 1990s early 2000s when there was most enthusiasm about um opening up uh, bringing china into the world trade organization uh, globalization bringing everybody together a lot of people were saying well when china starts to get richer and when china gets more involved in more complex international trade systems china is going to become more western they're going to but by they're going to be forced to become more democratic because clearly this is what works I, I, I think up to a point they're right in the 19th and 20th centuries the more a society moved down the path toward democratization you know, getting rid of gender hierarchies mm-hmm. opening up the citizen body to people of all religions the more they moved down this path the better they did so, you know the US Canada Western Europe tended to do better than countries that were much more conservative um, and so looked at from that perspective, it does seem like, yeah, yeah, sure, China is going to have to move toward the more individualized Western model. Yet now, I think, um, as we're moving into, you know, further into the 21st century, more and more people are starting to say, oh, well, maybe that's actually not the case. And again, looking at history, in the past, um, you know, when the U.S. started becoming more successful on the global stage at the end of the 19th century, the U.S. didn't get more Europeanized. Europeans started to worry about becoming Americanized. 
Christ. That sort of lesson in the past suggests maybe rather than China becoming westernized, the rest of the world is going to become more easternized. Mm. If China is able to develop an alternative model of success in a very digital, super interlinked global marketplace, that's just different from the marketplaces of the 19th and 20th centuries. And I think on this one, we just don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, your early optimism that China was going to become more democratic, that seems to be fading very quickly uh, over the last 10 years. And you know, maybe 50 years from now, we will all be talking about Confucius rather than Thucydides and talking mm -hmm. about you know, Chinese explorers like Zheng He rather than people like Columbus. Okay. Maybe that's the direction things are starting to go. Wow, Ian, that's fascinating stuff. I really uh, enjoy your breadth and scope of your analysis. We've got a similar question here that's been emailed in by Mark. He's saying, in your studies, do you find or not that human nature has changed much over time? This has always interested me. And if, I mean, and you've worked as an archeologist, so you're much closer to these now dead civilizations. But if I was to go back to ancient Rome, would, would I have a basis to understand them and them me or would we actually be quite alien from each other in terms of how we think uh, how we see the world um, is there this kind of difference in in history and consciousness over time yeah, yeah, Mark, that, that is a, another really fascinating question. Uh, and this is something I started thinking about quite a long time ago. When I first started teaching, my first proper job was at the University of Chicago. And there they have this great undergraduate program. Well, they had, they, they got rid of it. Um, great undergraduate program called the History of Western Civilization. And most of the students would take Western Civ at some point. And uh, the way it works was like discussion sections, small groups, usually 20 students or so. Um, and they, they don't read modern history. Books. Instead, they would read works produced in the past. So you'd read the read Thucydides, read the Song of Roland, then you just kind of sit around and talk about it. And one of the things that really struck me um, was how when in the, the fall quarter, when we were reading Greek and Roman material, the students immediately kind of got into this. It's like they had a sense of who Thucydides was or who Tacitus from the Roman Empire was and you know how these people were thinking. They, they felt this connection. These people are like us. And then we got into the winter quarter when we were reading the medieval stuff. And they, they read the Song of Roland where um, these heroes are breaking down in tears every five minutes and doing <laughs> these just inexplicable things right. and um and, and actually maybe not so much the song of Roland, but some of the other things we read the, the these authors would take it for granted of course people are fundamentally different from each other and it's absolutely right if i'm a lord that i will go around and despoil and plunder my peasants that's just what you do they're peasants they just have to expect this it's the way the world works and this world was just utterly alien to the students and it's pretty alien to me as well uh, and so uh, this i think is is fascinating why do we get these wild swings is it something to do with changing human nature or is it just something to do with the changes in the situations in which we live the kind of um lead us to privilege different ways of thinking about the world. Mm. And I've come to think it's very much a second of these. And I sort of moved in that direction largely by getting interested in psychology and um, some of the, the work that uh, evolutionary psychologists, experimental psychologists have done. And there's this famous um, experiment that uh, you, you probably already know about, the Stanford experiment that they ran years and years ago before this kind of thing was made illegal, where they um, basically set up this prison camp uh, with students and observe how the students who are appointed as guards become more and more mm -hmm. brutal as this thing goes on before they cut it up. And people just treat each other worse and worse if you give them the power and send them these signals telling them that it's okay to do this sort of thing, um, which I think is what you've got in medieval European culture. Um, seems to me, you know, from what I've read in the work of uh, the psychologists, that um, human nature in the sense of the, the, the biological side of this, the evolved component of human nature as an adaptation, um, that 
I don't think has really changed very much at all. We are fundamentally the same animals we've been for at least the last 50,000, probably the last 100,000 years. Um, what, what I do think that's going to change very much in the 21st century, but fundamentally our biology just hasn't changed. But um, you know, again, like you do an experiment in a lab, you take a rat and put it in a nice, happy, ratty place, it behaves one way. You put it in a nasty little cage, it behaves a different way. I think it's the same with humans. As the, we've changed the world through our innovation and the transformations these create um, they change the pressures acting on us and we're such flexible creative creatures we can live equally well in a very hierarchical society like ancient Egypt or in one like 21st century Canada we, we survive and do okay in both these places hmm. fascinating stuff Ian I just want to remind our viewers that at the top of the hour we're going to have as usual a members only post uh, dialogue with arguably Canada's greatest historian, Margaret McMillan. She's the Emeritus Professor of International History at the University of Oxford, Professor of History at the University of Toronto, award-winning author of a whole series of books. So please uh, join us for that post-dialogue. If you're not a member, you can join right now for free. Simply go to our website, monkdebates.com forward slash membership. Register there and we'll email you a link right away. We'll also post that registration link uh, in the Facebook comments uh, for this dialogue. So please join us for a post-dialogue conversation with Margaret McMillan. Now back uh, into you, we've got some other great questions here to work through. Here's another one that was emailed in by Lawrence. Lawrence is asking, uh, in my opinion, we as a species have advanced in our abilities past a point where we could take intentional positive control of our further social evolution. In fact, I think it's becoming dangerous for us not to. What is your opinion on this? And, and this is interesting, uh, Ian, because you know, in a lot of your work, you talk about this shift, this change from a species that is evolving primarily biologically and having to evolve very slowly as a result of that, to a species that increasingly is using technology to edit and evolve culturally at a pace that is as just exponential compared to biological evolution. Can you talk a little bit about that and why you think we might be on the cusp, an important kind of threshold here, a step change from a biologically led evolution to a culturally led evolution as a, as a species? Yeah, yeah, I think Lawrence has got a, another great question here. Before I forget, say hello to Margaret McMillan. I will. We seen each other, I think, in 10 years. Uh, we had dinner together at our British publisher's house back in 2010. Great. But uh, anyway, yeah, Lawrence's question. Yeah, I think in a way, of course, Lawrence is absolutely right to say we are moving into a period when we just don't seem to be able to control what's happening to us, when society and everything is changing so fast. It's just almost impossible, it seems, to get a grip on it. And yet the weird thing is that in a way we've kind of always been like that and you know it's, it's sort of something like you, you watch you know christmas is coming up you you watch something like a you know, christmas carol movie on tv and scrooge is sitting there and the fireplace is roaring the servants know their place and it's this wonderful stable world uh, but you know the actual world of the 1840s when dickens wrote that was the complete opposite everybody felt overwhelmed by social change as the industrial revolution was taking off and mass politics were emerging for the first time women's rights were becoming more of an issue than they ever been before slavery had just been abolished um, uh, in 1833 i think it was in, in the british empire everything was in turmoil Everyone seems to have the sense the world is coming apart. There's nothing we can do about it. So in one way, I would say, you know, there's nothing weird about what we're living through now. And we can learn a lot from the way people have coped with these sorts of problems before. I mean, I, actually, one great thing, 1840s, there's this great panic. Uh, railway engines are just coming in. People are traveling on train, trains. There's this great panic that if the human body starts being moved at speeds much above 30 miles an hour, it's all disintegrate. Right. We, we cannot move that fast. That's why we can only run at about 25 miles an hour. Um, great panics about these sorts of things. And of course, we've got similar sorts of panics now. because we, we just don't know where these forces take us. So in one way, it's kind of, yeah, yeah, more of the same. Um, in other ways, though, I think you know, for the reasons um, that you, Rudyard, were just alluding to, this time, I think, really is different. Um, and uh, you, you can say, in a way... Uh, 
since modern humans evolved 150,000 years ago, they started acting a little bit like uh, the way we act now. Um, you know, for a long time, the, the, the evolution was driven by this very slow pr uh, process of biological change, and you know, random mutation in our genes, and the more su successful ones spreading through the gene pool. Um, then we start to change by being able to evolve culturally. Our brain gets to the point we can change our behavior. So you, know, you, you uh, humans spread out to the edge of Siberia. At one point, you would have had to wait it at the edge of Siberia until you evolved biologically to become furry, have thick fur, before you can move into Siberia, like the mammoths had done. Um, then though, we got to the point, hey, we can kill another animal, steal its fur, cut off its skin, and sew that skin up around ourselves. We, we can use cultural adaptation to do what biology had mm -hmm. been doing previously. Suddenly, everything starts to move a lot faster. Now we're at the point where we're able to reach inside our own bodies and inside our own brains. And the, the pace has you know, taken off so unbelievably rapidly over the last 20, 30 years. But now uh, you know, we realize we have created all these ethical quandaries um, by our own ability to intervene in ourselves. And this is really is moving us off into a place we've never been before, where we have the potential you know, to decide we can turn ourselves into a super race by just you know, chain meddling with the genes of unborn babies. But we have to know what a super race is and whether we want to be a super race. You know, biologists have this saying, evolution is smarter than you. You start screwing around with evolution, you are going to pay a price for this. So, yeah, in some ways it's more of the same. In other ways, we're on in a whole new world already. Hmm. Fascinating stuff, uh, Ian. Let's go to an another question here. It's from uh, Gary. It came in by email. Gary's asking, why is modern democratic capitalism failing so miserably at taking care of seniors, the children, the poor, the very people that carry the load? The failure is so glaring across uh, this nation. I could be referring to the United States, I guess. Um, China appears to grow in leaps and bounds, all the while raising its poor uh, into the middle class. And maybe that's a, a way for us to talk a little bit, in about your views. What are they on the kind of inevitability of uh, social democratic, democratic capitalism as a way of organizing society that confers advantages that allows it to outcompete other systems of of human organization and therefore through social evolution it becomes the preferential system and eventually we're all going to move in that direction. You've talked a little bit about that but I'd like to hear some more. Yeah, it is yet another really interesting question. Um, and I guess I say in some way, I mean, Gary talked about your failing to care for the elderly. Um, one of the problems we've got now is that we've just got so many old people I and mean, people like me. I, I just turned 60 this year. We, uh, you know, there's always been people who live to be 60, but hardly any of them. Um, one of the great achievements of the 19th and 20th centuries, you know, led by the capitalist economies, was uh, creating conditions where people could just live to be a lot older than they'd ever been before. So now we have these huge numbers of elderly people, um, which we didn't have in the past. And this is a fundamental social problem for successful economies of how do you care for people who... Um, some of them are going to be too old to work and, uh, and their own, I mean, too unwell to work and earn their own livings anymore. So you've got to generate the wealth to support them. Others are not. And we see plenty of people working on into the 70s, 80s even. What is that going to mean for young people though, trying to move up? And you know, this is a big question we have in academia. Professors' lives are not super hard on the body on the whole. And a lot of us just go on and on and on and we won't go away and retire. What does this mean for all the new 20-somethings getting their PhDs and trying to get a break into this field? So I think in some ways we got unprecedented problems. Um, in other ways, I guess, I mean, I would actually disagree with Gary a little bit on some of this, uh, that um, I think you're compared to uh, most earlier societies, we do a really good job in the modern capitalist societies of caring for the poor, uh, the, the downtrodden and the outcast. It's just that we're not doing as good a job of it as we were um, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And this, I think, raises larger 
question of um, you know, when we look back on the uh, welfare states in the West, um, say the 1950s, 60s, 70s, uh, where it seemed to be a one story, steady sort of continuing expansion of care and expansion of rights for more and more people. Was that the shape of a long-term story that we should expect to keep going through the 21st century in ever more inclusive societies? Or was this just some sort of weird blip um, that the West had been enormously successful, pulled way ahead of the rest of the world, suddenly had all these resources that had never been available before, um, economic systems that thrived by including more and more people. So it's like, you know, the more you brought people in, the better you did, and the better you did, the more people you could bring in, and everything else on this upward spiral and maybe then we've reached the end of that upward spiral i think this is a the big question are we moving into economic models in the 21st century where all of a sudden it's more like what we've seen through most of the history of say the agricultural societies in the world where you know, if uh, you were the ruling class it really didn't matter that much if a lot of your peasants died off because there were always more peasants there's massive underemployment on the land it just didn't matter that much um and at the moment, I say, you know, it's hard to know where things are going to take us, whether the 21st century transformations, the digitalization of everything, whether they are going to produce societies that are more and more inclusive and needs to have uh, more of their citizens involved in what's going on, or whether we're going to see a tiny elite just pulling away from everybody else and leaving the rest to you know, make, make shift as they can, or whether, in fact, we're just going to see some computers pulling ahead of the rest of us, and mm. all of humanity is going to be in the same boat. Mm. Fascinating. To build on that, Douglas has just emailed in a question that says, uh, let me paraphrase here, um, many studies project the world's population will plateau over the coming uh, 30 years or so, and then commence uh, a significant, and uh, Douglas claims, irreversible decline. Does Ian subscribe to this forecast? And if so, how does it impact his thinking on the future of human civilization? There's that quip by Demestra that demographics is destiny. Do you subscribe? So, sort of yes, I guess I would say. I think demographics has been destiny through most of history, and I think people have kind of understood this for quite a long time now. Um, but, and uh, I mean, I and again, I would also more or less agree with the predictions that say uh, that the population, global population, is going to level off and um, start declining during the 21st century. Although we have already seen some uh, people walking back a little bit from the kind of predictions they were making just 10 years ago, when this was expected to happen relatively soon uh, in the future, in the, the coming generation. So people are now being a little more cautious about this, saying, oh, actually, it's not going quite the way we thought. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer. But, I mean, yeah, all, all the trends do seem to indicate that's what's going to happen. I mean, in particular, this one that some people will say is a kind of a sociological law, that as your society gets richer, People will tend to have fewer children, but invest more in this smaller number of children because there's now more. You know, your children are less likely to die, so you don't have to have you know, spare kids as insurance. And there are more opportunities for a wider range of people if they invest in the education and help of their children than there were in the past. So it just makes sense to have a smaller number of more heavily capitalized children, <laughs> which I realize is a horrible way to describe it. But that's what seems to happen. And um, as that happens, I mean, obviously it's already happened in East Asia. In China, population um, birth rates had already started falling before they put the one-child policy in place. It turned out to be rather an, un, a very cruel and kind of unnecessary policy. Um, in Africa, uh, Africa is going to be the big question on this. You know, at what point do African populations level up and then start declining? But again, all the signs are we should expect this to happen in the next 30, 40, 50 years. Thanks, Ian. Uh, we've got a question here from Ralph. Um, he's going to use a term from one of your books, so you're going to have to explain it to us. Uh, if the point of global cops, uh, your term, and again, we'll let you describe it, is to raise the cost of violence to prohibitive levels, how do we explain the effectively constant warfare throughout the periods of Pax Americana and Pax Britannica? Great question, mm -hmm. Ralph. Um, so unpack that for us, Ian. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, uh, one of the books that Rudyard mentioned at the beginning that I've written called War, What Is It Good For? Um, and I, I wrote this 
after, just after I finished Why the West Rules for Now, where one of the things I've been looking at, at the end of Why the West Rules was the way um, in earlier history, every time you got a great shift in wealth and power from one region of the globe to another, it was always accompanied by massive violence. And you know, because we now have nuclear weapons, this is a you know, truly alarming prospect. So I thought, well, can we learn anything more, more granular, more detailed about this process by looking back across the, the last many thousands of years? And so um, I, I set out and, and did this. And I came to a conclusion that um, actually a number of evolutionary anthropologists had already started reaching, uh, going back to the 15, 20 years. And Stephen Pinker wrote this book, uh, Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, came out in 2011, making a rather similar sort of set of points. And th this uh, idea is one that was kind of obvious already to Thomas Hobbes back in the 17th century. And Hobbes said, Hobbes is writing during the English Civil War. All these people have been slaughtered all around him. And he says, well, you know, what the heck is going on here? And um, he came to the conclusion that left to their own devices, people will just go around killing each other all the time which actually seems not to be the case. But they will use quite a lot of violence. We've evolved to be able to use violence to settle our problems. In the absence of constraints to make us choose not to use violence, we use kind of a lot of violence. And Hobbes says, well, what is it that um, persuades people not to be violent? And he said, it's Leviathan, um, a name he took from the Bible, a really scary monster in the book of Job. And he says, what prevents people being violent is when you get governments that are as terrifying as the biblical Leviathan. The government has a monopoly over the legitimate use of force. It has way more force at its disposal than you do. So if you get in an argument with your neighbor and you want to solve this argument by burning your neighbor's farm to the ground and killing his whole family, um, the state says to you, don't do that. If you do that, we'll do the same thing to you. Because the state doesn't want you all killing each other. It wants you quietly working on your farms and paying taxes so the kings can do all the stuff kings do. But the state creates this environment that exerts pressure on the subjects within the kingdom not to use violence all the time. So it's this weird paradox. As the states get bigger and more sophisticated, more able to use violence themselves, they actually drive down the overall level of violence by dissuading everybody else from being violent. And um, I think when we look at the long run of history, we see these states, these, these leviathans getting bigger and bigger, more and more reach and power driving down rates of violent death around the world while simultaneously raising the risk because the states get bigger so if they do go to war they can kill way more people than they ever used to do. Until by the 19th century we've gotten to a point where the British Empire is able to function as a kind of global cop. Britain doesn't rule the world or even dominate the whole world but it's got sufficient military and financial muscle that it can dissuade other governments really to all around the world, dissuade them from using force against each other, or at least can limit what they do with their force. So like during the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln's biggest nightmare was not that he's going to lose the Battle of Gettysburg or something like that, but that the British are not, not even going to come into the war. The British will just recognize the Confederacy as a legitimate government which will then allow it to access all the bond markets. Um, it'll become much more difficult to, to blockade the Confederacy. And at that point, he's terrified that if that happens, um, the, the, the Civil War will actually be stopped by the British political economic intervention and the Confederacy will become independent. So you start getting these states with the capacity to act on a global scale, driving down rates of death even further by discouraging wars elsewhere. But if it goes wrong, as it does in 1914, of course, the results are absolutely horrendous. And that, I think, I would say, you know, hardly the first historian to suggest this, there are all sorts of analogies between the, the situation the U.S. has been in since 1989, arguably since 1945, and what the British were in in the middle part of the 19th century. And all sorts of similarities between what's happening with U.S. power now and what happened with British power at the very end of the 19th century. When you start getting these challenges, it becomes less and less clear that the global cop really is the sheriff able to enforce its will on the beat. You get more and more people kind of trying their luck, sort of mm -hmm. prodding the global cop, saying, well, will you go to war or will you, will you threaten me severely if I do this? How about if I do this? And yeah, if history is any guide, we never get the calculations right 100% of the time. And the problem here is that 
in the right circumstances, getting it wrong just once, just one miscalculation, gives you a nuclear version of 1914. So, um, yeah, that, that I think, is the, the big danger. And I think the more your Globocop starts to slip, the more you're going to see wars bubbling up in different places, challenges mounting. So this is one of the reasons why I say the next 40 years are going to be so alarming, so dangerous. In China professes, though, you know, not to have uh, global ambitions in the same way that a Pax Americana or Pax Britannia did, or are quite explicit about their desire to build a uh, global empire. Does that change your thinking about how the next 40 years could look? In, in effect, if you have a declining hegemon, but the rival isn't Kaiser Wilhelm, it isn't a you know, an insurgent rival who wants to usurp the dominant power. So how could that potentially play out? Or, or do you think that it's very difficult ultimately from the, for the Chinese not to accept the role of global cop because somebody has to be uh, the global cop, either because then the whole system doesn't work if you don't have one. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Fascinating question. Oh, yeah. Xi Jinping, as you say, does not have to be Kaiser Wilhelm. Um, there's another really good model out there for Xi Jinping, which would be Teddy Roosevelt in the United States. At you know, the time when Germany is increasingly challenging Britain uh, around 1900, the U.S. is in the even better position to challenge Britain. Its, its economy is bigger than Britain's by this point. Um, it has the potential to build enough warships to dominate, push Britain completely off the top of the pile. But they don't. Uh, and of course, geography has a lot to do with that. So, you know, the United States is in a very different place from Germany, very different threats and challenges. But they find ways to work it out with the British. And of course, the British also are more willing, for all sorts of reasons, more willing to try to work it out with the Americans than they are with the Germans. So yes, there are multiple models out there. And if we look at chi recent Chinese behavior, um, there's kind of, my sense is there's two schools of thought among the international relations people. And one says is, oh my God, these Chinese are so scary. Look at how much their policies have changed since the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. They're so much more assertive. Look at all the artificial islands in the South China Sea. They are definitely you know, trying to push the US out of the Pacific, out of the West Pacific. And this is just the first step to replacing the US as the the global dominant power. And it's hard to see how that can happen without there being a war. The other school of thought, though, says, well, yes, but you look at what China's currently doing, and um, it's sort of securing its near abroad, right? The way, say, the United States at the end of the 19th century, the US secures the Caribbean. They're not going to have any messing around with foreign powers in the Caribbean. They're absolutely going to stamp that out. And they'll fight for that. So they fight the Spaniards. And they'll fight for that. But they're not building these great ocean-going fleets like the British. And they're not uh, having military bases all over the Indian Ocean, I mean, obviously the Philippines, but not all over the Indian Ocean, not trying to challenge at a global scale. And some people will say, look at China. China is sort of like the late 19th century US, not the late 19th century Germany. I mean, China does have a base at Djibouti in East Africa, but they've been very, very restrained about any kind of actions at a global level and building you know, a high seas fleet, basically, that would challenge the United States um, out on the open oceans. And um, so two schools of thought on that. One says this uh, this kind of restraint, this indicates that China actually is going to be a different kind of global power. And um, something like the Belt and Road Initiative really is what the Chinese say. It's a way to you know, have um, the tide raising all the boats for everybody, tying together the infrastructure of the old world. It's not an attempt to outflank the American encirclement of China. It's not something that's going to strengthen China's position for a coming confrontation. Um, so that might well be true. Or the more pessimistic view is just, well, hey, China is at an early stage at the moment. Of course, they're building lots of relatively short range carrier killer missiles to fire in their, their near abroad, their close in waters. Of course, they're building lots of submarines and not building lots of aircraft carriers because they haven't yet got to the point when they are trying to project power out all the way to the, the west coast of North America. So again, I think 
I mean, I tend to think when you use history to think about the future, almost always what it does is lay out the parameters for the debate and say, yeah, these are the trends that we can see. This is where they might be going. We can maybe form some sense of what is the most likely outcome. But a lot of this is dependent on the actions of individuals at the small scale. I, nobody was guessing 15 years ago that China would now have a leader like Xi Jinping. Or, or the, the U.S. would have had one like Donald Trump. Um, a lot does depend on the actions of the individuals, and that, I think, is much harder to predict. Right. Well, Ian, what we've been doing with all these dialogues is providing our listeners with the recommendations of our invited guests, because it's a helpful way, I think, for each of us to, to add to our bookshelves, to add to our, our kind of intellectual capital uh, while we've got time. Uh, sitting at home. So here's three books. I'm going to go through them each uh, individually. If you could give a quick synopsis of why you're recommending that people uh, should pick them up and put them on their, their Christmas holiday reading list. The first is The Great Leveler. What's that about? This is about, I, I should uh, make a little disclosure first of all. This is written by one of my colleagues at Stanford, a historian named Walter Scheidel. And it's this wonderful book um, that uh, he started writing, Walter started writing it just when Thomas Piketty's uh, book on capital in the 21st century came out. Where, you know, Piketty famously was saying that in uh, capitalist economies, wealth accumulates faster than the economy grows. And so there's this inbuilt dynamic toward the rich getting richer. And um, very few things can reverse this dynamic. And then Piketty talks a little bit about government interventions that potentially could reverse the dynamic in the 21st century. And so Walter said, well, um, what will happen? And th this is something I think at Stanford, many of us are interested in asking these questions. What would happen if, once again, we looked at a really, really long term global scale on uh, the history of inequality? And Walter came to these profoundly depressing conclusions that he said, this is not about capitalism. This is something about the way human economies always work, mm. that wealth, uh, people accumulate wealth as much as possibly can be done uh, within that sort of economic system. They, uh, it's wealth gets centralized until if you centralize it anymore, people start starving to death. And sometimes you actually do go beyond that point. They do start starving to death. The only things that have ever reversed the concentration of wealth have been the really horrendous ones. Pandemics. The Black Death was a wonderful leveler of wealth mm. and inequality in Europe. Great wars, World War II, um, never, and World War I for that matter, but especially World War II, never been anything like it. It wiped out the, many of the great fortunes in the Western world, redistributed the money uh, and the, the potential downward to a much broader swath of the population. So Walter says, sure, yes, we might reverse these depressing trends about the concentration um, of wealth, but be careful what you wish for. Hmm. Fascinating read. Let's go to your next pick, uh, The Storm Before the Calm. Yeah, this is a book by um, George Friedman, who was a strategic thinker who uh, founded the organization Stratfor. Um, and uh, this is an attempt to sort of draw on his you know, deep mastery uh, of global politics and economics to talk about um, what's likely to happen in the future. He has one book called The Next Hundred Years, another book called The Next Decade. Um, this book, uh, The Storm Before the Calm, is all about how the, the future is sort of rosy, but to get to the rosy future, we are likely to go through a period of profound uncertainty that uh, potentially could be disastrous. Uh, and so, yes, it's a fascinating read, but a book by a guy who really does know uh, the global economy and geopolitics inside out. Excellent. And your final pick is The Third Revolution. Um, yes. So uh, this is a, a, a book about the, the sort of technological transformations uh, that I was talking about earlier, um, about what is likely to happen to humanity um, as uh, the, the, the digital revolution really takes off. Thank you so much, uh, Ian. It's just, uh, it's such a pleasure to spend a bit of time um, stepping outside of uh, the 140 characters of a tweet or the news cycle of the next four hours to really reflect on the breadth, the depth, the scope of history and try to use that in an in a interesting and engaging way to think about our collective future. And you've certainly done that for us and for our audience tonight. So on behalf of the Monk Debate community, thank you for being part of this dialogue. Well, thank you very much. It was great being uh, on the show. Great.
Ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Ian Morris, and that uh, concludes our dialogue. We've got one more dialogue coming up uh, in this fall season. We'll have that for you uh, next week, December 9th at 8 p.m. Eastern with Barry Weiss, a really interesting uh, journalist who has had some interesting experiences this year, leaving the New York Times, uh, striking out on her own, an advocate for uh, free speech and uh, someone with strong views on the current state of the discussion of culture and identity and all those hot button issues uh, in this extraordinary moment uh, we find ourselves in. Just a reminder that um, please join us right now. In a matter of minutes, we'll be kicking off our separate live stream with Margaret McMillan. She's, uh, again, a terrific uh, thinker who brings that broad historical experience and analysis to her insights. We're gonna talk a little bit more about Canada and the situation we find ourselves in now. What are the lessons in Canadian history that we could bring to bear to, to understand uh, this, this moment of uh, intense uh, speculation and uncertainty? Uh, and finally, if you are looking to join that post-dialogue conversation, send us a link right now. There's still time at uh, www.monkdebates.com forward slash membership. You'll get an automated email reply with the link to join us with our conversation with Margaret McMillan. We'll also, again, put that link into uh, the Facebook comments uh, for this dialogue. I wanna thank uh, just a great group of partners that have helped us uh, bring all these dialogues to you week in and week out for the last nine weeks, the Peter and Melanie Monk Foundation. They're really the instigators of all of this and so much more. Our presenting sponsors, Onyx and Gluskin Chef. Our supporting sponsors, Tories LLP, Bond, Brand, Loyalty, and Cassette Media. Thank you. A great group of partners who's taking these dialogues across North America. CPAC, Canada's Public Affairs Channel, GEM, CBC's streaming channel, our partners at Facebook, Indigo, Canada's largest bookseller where you can get all of Ian's books and his recommendations. The Buffalo, Toronto, uh, WNED, PBS station, thank you. Our friends across the border, the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper, and Antica, our podcast producer. Well, that wraps up this dialogue. Thank you uh, for joining me. We'll do it all again uh, next week with Barry Weiss on December 9th. In the meantime, be well, be safe, and uh, enjoy uh, free and open conversation with each other here at the Monk Dialogues.